fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a haughty high of silver. The Lone Ranger. <laughs> Before this exciting adventure, a word from our sponsor. General Mills, makers of Cheerios, the oat cereal that's ready to eat, Benny Crocker mixes, and Wheaties, the breakfast of champions. Present by special recording, The Lone Ranger. Say, youngsters, what's your favorite summer fruit? If it's peaches, blueberries, or pineapple, it would make a delicious Betty Crocker upside-down cake. All you need is a package of Betty Crocker Yellow Cake Mix. It's so easy. The finest ingredients are right in the package. Ingredients like soft as silk cake flour and pure vegetable shortening. You just add water and two fresh eggs. Beat and bake. For the upside down part, line a square pan with a fruit and a sprinkling of brown sugar. Then pour in half the batter and bake. Your mom can use the extra batter for a breakfast cake topped with brown sugar and cinnamon. And Betty Crocker Yellow Cake turns out perfect every time. In fact, Betty Crocker guarantees a perfect cake every time you bake. Cake after cake after cake. Perfect or write General Mills, Minneapolis, Minnesota for your money back. Keep several packages of Betty Crocker Yellow Cake Mix on hand and enjoy one soon. With his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, the daring and resourceful mask rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fella. I am Silver. Hooray! The Lone Ranger and Tonto rode an uphill trail that led to the Wyoming town of Circle City a few miles away. When they reached the crest of the ridge, they saw a farmhouse burning in the valley. Let's go, Toto. Come on, Silver! Racing downhill toward the fire, the masked man and his Indian companion saw a woman lying on the ground in front of the blazing cabin. She struggled to her feet as they brought their horses to a halt. Hold it, hold it. Oh, oh, the woman was young and appeared to be half blinded by blood that came from a head wound. We'll help you. Not me! My husband, he's in the cabin! Stay with the woman, Toto. The Lone Ranger dashed across the yard and through the open doorway into the cabin. <laughs> The flames roared and sparks dropped from the roof as the Lone Ranger, half choking from smoke, half dragged and half carried the limp body of a man across the floor. You're making it. The Lone Ranger plunged out of the smoke and fire with the unconscious man just as the roof collapsed. Oh, thank heaven you got him off. Is he alive? Yes, he's alive. Are you all right? Stay away from me. Don't be frightened by my mask. We I can't... know your voice. You're number one. You tried to murder us, and now you're back to finish the job. You're wrong. We're trying to help you. <laughs> Seeing Tonto giving her husband gentle and skillful first aid treatment, the woman's terror lessened. Oh, I must have made a mistake. I'm grateful for your help. But are you an outlaw? No. Uh, people call me the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger? Oh, if I could only be sure. Please trust me. Tell me your name. McGill. I'm Cassie, and my husband's name is Tom. You mistook me for someone else. Yes. Your voice is the same as that of the leader of the hooded men. Hooded men? Yes. They wear robes and hoods, and each robe has a number on it. For months, they've been robbing homesteaders like us and burning our houses. About a dozen of them came here. Number one shot Tom. They took what little money we had, then one of them struck me with a pistol. Knocked me out. After that, they must have set fire to the cabin. Coming to... Tom, darling, everything's all right. The hooded men are gone. Uh, I thought I heard a voice. The Lone Ranger saved your life. Lone Ranger? Yes, Tom. Right now, Tom and I want to provide for your comfort and safety. Then we'll try to find those hooded raiders. I'm sure these men are to be trusted, Tom. Have you any place to go? Any friends? Well, I... I think Whispering John Woods will take us in. Who is Whispering John Woods? A retired rancher who lives just this side of Circle City in a big white house. Well, uh, why is your friend called Whispering John? 
He lost his voice a number of years ago. He can't speak above a whisper. Oh, did the raiders take your horses? They must be. The corral is empty. I see you have a one-horse buckboard left. I'll take you folks to Whispering John's place in it by fastening the shafts to my saddle girth and riding silver. You're very kind, mister. Now I'll fix up the buckboard so you two will be comfortable during the trip. Mm. What me do? Find the gang's trail, Tonto, and try to follow it. When I come back, I'll follow you. Uh, Miss Abby. It was an hour later when the Lone Ranger turned his horse into a driveway at Whispering John Wood's ranch house. In the buckboard drawn by Silver, the wounded homesteaders lay on a blanket-covered bed of straw. As the masked man drew rein in front of the wide veranda, the house door was opened, and a tall man of middle age and dignified appearance stepped out. Cassie motioned toward the masked man. Don't be afraid of him, Mr. Wood. He's the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger? He saved Tom's life and brought us here. The hooded killers burned our house. The scoundrels. As Whispering John Woods helped the wounded couple from the buckboard, the masked man released and dropped the shafts, freeing Silver. At that moment, a hard-faced man came out of a bunkhouse on one side of Woods' elaborate home. He approached cautiously, his right hand on a gun butt. Hey, John, what's going on anyhow? Who's that masked man? It's all right, Skeet. He's the Lone Ranger. He is? What's he doing here? He's after the hooded rider, Skeet. The ruffians have been riding again. You people might help me by keeping my identity and purpose a secret from now on. Don't worry, mister. Skeet is Mr. Wood's foreman, a good, dependable neighbor like the rest of us. Sure thing. We'll all keep mum. I hope so. Oh, mister. Yes? I'd like to talk to you privately. What about? I have some information for you but it'll take time to get it together. Will you come back at midnight? Yes, I'll be here. Easy. Let me come up. Adios, friend. Goodbye. <laughs> Meanwhile, Toto followed a trail that would have been invisible to most people. Open, huh? He frequently had to dismount and examine the hard ground on hands and knees to determine the route taken by the raiders. It was late afternoon when the Lone Ranger, following Toto's trail, overtook his Indian friend. Toto stood beside Scout and held a horseshoe in his hand. Where did you get the horseshoe, Toto? Me find it. Here, on trail. Oh? Be sure it come from one of Crook's horses. Have you followed their trail this far? Ah. Uh, gang split up long trail. One go one way, one another. Here, only three men ride together. And we'll concentrate on the prince left by the hoof without a shoe. That's easy to follow. All right, bring the horseshoe with you. We got it. Easy. He's got it. Come on. Get him up. Come on. Come on. Come on. Presently, the Lone Ranger and Toto followed only one horse, the one that had lost a shoe. The two men rode through a cedar forest and suddenly drew rain. From the shelter of trees, they peered into a cleared space where they saw a shack, and near the door, a man preparing to shoe a horse. Toto, the line shack. Gentlemen always keep nails, tools, and horseshoes stored in such places. You must be man we follow. But he not wear robe or hood now. Oh, easy, sit a bit up. Just about, Toto. What we do? We leave the horses here and close in on that man. Ah. Me see his shoe fit horse. Busy examining his horse's hoof, the man did not look up until the Lone Ranger and Toto were within a few paces. Then he exclaimed, A masked man! An engine! Now reach for a gun. Raise your hands and keep them high. Oh, that is you. For a minute, I thought you were an ordinary outfit. Who do you think I am? <laughs> you, you can't fool me, Chief. You're number one. I'd know your voice anywhere. Hey, you're smart to wear the mask instead of the regular outfit when you ride across the plains. <laughs> Robe and hood are easy to spot. Take his gun, Dotto. <laughs> hey, why are you disarming me? Where did you lose the horseshoe? Between here and the McGill place. If that's why you came here... We found I... the shoe. It's probably mine. Uh, let me see if it fits. Uh, Chief, 
I know the rule about not leaving evidence, but a man can't help it. A man can't help it when his horse casts a shoe. What about it, Toto? It's just right size. All nail holes in plain places. That shoe could hang you. No, no, not that. Don't make me stand trial by the gang. I don't want to be hanged for something that wasn't my fault. Have a little mercy, number one. I'm not number one. You're in better hands than his. Uh, not number one? Then who are you? That doesn't matter to you. What matters is that you can be jailed, tried, and convicted in the McGill case on the strength of that horseshoe and what you've told us. You're a lawman. Look, he was up. Let me find him and fill his saddlebag. A white robe with a tashed hood. The robe has a figure ten on it. So you're number ten in the gang. This makes more evidence against you. Tie his hands, Toto. Uh, 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 now, wait. Listen, I- I've got some money. I'll pay. A bribe? I'll do anything if you let me go. I'll leave these parts. You're going to face trial. I'll never have a chance. Number one will kill me. What's your name? Ben Boyd. I, I live in town. I'll do anything if you'll keep number one from killing me. You'll be safe only if he's in jail. But I'd help you get him if I could. Who is number one? I don't know, mister. Honest, I don't. What's the purpose of your raid? Everyone shares in the cash we get. But the real purpose is to drive out the nesters. When the homestead is driven out, one of us proves his claim on the land, gets the title, and number one buys it from him. I don't know what he does with the land. When does the gang meet again? Tonight, at 10 o'clock. We meet near the top of Gowdy's Hill. That's it over yonder. You have a password? Yes. Tonight, it's Victoria. If you've lied, you'll pay. I've told you the truth, mister. We'll see. Try and gag him, Tonto. Uh-huh. We'll leave him inside the shack for the federal marshal to pick up later. We'll continue our Lone Ranger adventure in just a moment. All over the country, in every direction, how you, how you doing is the question. And here's one the that happy people have to make. Oh, we need to do okay. Okay. That's the word up north. Just ask the champions. Up north, we know what Wheaties mean to guys like Slug and Harvey Keen. We love to see him belt that ball and make the fielders climb the wall. And Richie Ashburn, yes, indeed, he plays baseball at Wheaties speed. Just watch him flash from base to base. This boy could win in any race. Yes, sir, Harvey Keen and Richie Ashburn are longtime Wheaties fans. Both of them know there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Keep on eating your Wheaties and you'll be doo-doo-doo-doo and I'll be okay. Now to continue. At ten that night, twelve men met in a moonlit hollow near the top of Gowdy's Hill. Some came on horseback, some on foot, but all wore hoods and robes, and each robe bore a red number sewed on the front. No one suspected that number ten was the Lone Ranger, who had made use of Ben Boyne's regalia to attend the secret meeting. Number one faced the others, and spoke in a voice like that of the Lone Ranger. After preliminary business, he said, Ben, when I said the McGills could not be frightened into leaving their land, I was right. That's why we left them to die in a fire. They didn't die. They were rescued by the Lone Ranger. What? From sources I shall not reveal, I've learned that Whispering John Woods is harboring the McGills and intends to help them fight us. And the Lone Ranger intends to fight us. The Lone Ranger will be at Woods' home at midnight to get information and evidence to use against him. Well, let's get them all. Come on. I want you to go to Whispering John's house at midnight. Capture the Lone Ranger and the McGills. Take them somewhere out of town before you kill them. What about Whispering John? Leave him alone. I'll take care of him myself. I'm leaving now. Remember, no one else is to leave until I've been gone for half an hour. Easy, boy. Get man. men dispersed with plans to reassemble just before midnight. The Lone Ranger hurried down the hill to a secluded spot where Toto waited with the horses. 
As he hurriedly put the hood and robe into his saddlebag, he told about the murder plans. Then Toto said, Gee, Masabi, how do you think number one know about you, McGill? One of the men in the gang is whispering John Foreman, a fellow named Skeet. I recognize his voice. Skeet knows about us. He probably passed the information on to number one. Oh. And what we do now? We go to Whispering John's place and hide our horses near his stables. While you watch from there, I'll call on Whispering John. All right, easy. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop it. At 11 o'clock that night in Whispering John's home, Tom and Cassie McGill had retired to an upstairs bedroom. And Whispering John sat in his large living room reading a newspaper when the Lone Ranger entered. You're an hour too early. Yes, and I didn't take time to wrap on the door. No time to waste. Something wrong? Yes, the hooded men are coming. They want me and the McGills. We still have time to get the young homesteaders to town where the marshal can protect them. We can stand off the scoundrels here. No, your own men can't be trusted. Your foreman belongs to the gang. What? You'd be endangering yourself. I can't believe it. You haven't time to argue. Where are Tom and Cassie? Upstairs in bed. Come this way. Right. Rising from his chair, Whispering John turned his back to the Lone Ranger and walked slowly toward a side door while stealthily drawing a gun from a shoulder holster. He turned suddenly. Raise your hands. You. Get them up. Taken wholly off guard, the masked man obeyed. You. You're number one. Finally found it out, eh? Lower one hand slowly and unbuckle your gun belt. Let it drop to the floor. You can't get away with this. I've been getting away with it for a long time. And no one, not even my foreman, has suspected me. Drop the gun belt. It seems there is a traitor in my gang. Who told you the men were coming here to get you and the McGills? You will not learn that from me. I'm in no hurry. You'll be persuaded to talk when my men arrive. The sudden, surprising revelation called for a quick revision of the masked man's plans. He set himself to dive low at John Wood's knees, hoping the bullet that was sure to come would pass over his body. So you'd like to know my identity? Well, to find out, you'll have to kill me. Number one's legs were swept from under him from the force of the masked man's charge. While on the floor, he fired again. The shot went wild. I'll kill you. The Lone Ranger swung his right fist. The blow struck John Wood's stomach. Here's another. It was a knockout blow straight to the chin. As the Lone Ranger took John's gun, then picked up his gun belt, Tom and Cassie rushed into the room. What's the shooting? We heard Cassie. Him. John's on the floor. Whispering John Wood is your number one man. We heard his voice. Hey, Toddy, we hear gunplay. Yes, Toto. Number one nearly got me. You're wounded. Your shoulder. It doesn't bother me. I'm sure it's only a scratch. Whispering John. On floor. He's number one, Toto. Try and gag him before he regains consciousness. Ah, what are you doing? The Lone Ranger buckled on his gun belt and explained what had happened while he searched the room. Toto did an effective job of finding the unconscious outlaw. He had just finished tying a gag in place when the masked man drew a hood and robe from a table drawer. Well, here's what I've been looking for. The hood and robe. Number one. What we do now, Kimasali? The carry John into the next room. Tom, you take his gun and guard him. Whatever you say. I'll help you, Tom. I'll wear number one's regalia and meet the rest of the gang. And what me do? Hurry to town, Toto. Tell the federal marshal everything. Tell him Lone Ranger here? Yes, yeah, tell him if you'll bring a posse and surround the house, he might be able to capture all of the outlaws. <laughs> Shortly before midnight, when the Lone Ranger, hooded and robed as number one, heard horses stop outside. He opened the door, saw the costume gang dismounting, and called, Morning, men! Well, it's number one. We didn't expect to find you here like this. Come in, I'll explain everything. Right, well, sure. Men, the McGill's and Whispering John are where I wanted them. What about the Lone Ranger? You'll meet him later. Number 10 isn't here. He uh, couldn't get here. He's tied up. But there's somebody here who doesn't belong to the gang. Well, how are we going to find him? I'll find him. I'll not risk being shot. All of you, line up against the long wall. Unbuckle your gun belts. Let them drop. And remember, any man who makes a false move gets a bullet. I'm watching you. That's it. Now take off your hoods and robes. I'll soon see who doesn't belong to the gang. 
At that moment, the Lone Ranger, who was the only man in a position to look through the front windows, saw Tonto on the veranda. The Indian grinned and signaled. Then Skeet said, Well, number one, all unhooded. Do you see anyone who don't belong? I'll show you the man. Holding a gun in his right hand, the Lone Ranger raised his left and removed the hood. Here he is. The masked man, the Lone Ranger. Stand still, get your hands up. Freeze, you cold hat. One move, we shoot. Look, the federal marshal. And the parson. You're covered from every window. Don't shoot, we give up. Come in, you deputies. Gather up the guns and handcuffs. Yeah, take care of the marshal. Don't you cover the folks. They got handcuffs. Oh. While the terrorists were being handcuffed, the Lone Ranger pulled off the robe and called to Tom McGill in the adjoining room. Tom, free the prisoner's ankles and remove the gag. Then bring him in here. A moment later, Tom and Captain McGill entered the living room with John Wood. Whispering John. He led the gang, Marshal. Even his men didn't know who he was, so they knew his voice. That's why he spoke in a whisper while pretending to be an honest rancher. I see it all now. Tom and Cassie McGill and a confessed member of the gang named Ben Boyne, whom you will find in the Cedar Line camp, will supply you with enough evidence to convict Woods and the others. Mister, cleaned up the worst gang in the West. I hope that they'll be away for the homesteaders to get back to land. When the law gets through with these crooks, there'll be justice done and damages paid. All right, Toto, our work here is finished. Adios. Goodbye. Folks, from now on, this part of the country is going to be a good place for good people to settle. Thanks to the Lone Ranger. copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated is produced by Pendle Campbell Muir Incorporated. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. Your announcer, Fred Boyd. Listen to the Lone Ranger, brought to you by special recording Mondays through Fridays at this same time.